in a world that was very, very different. Let's see, okay. Um, <laughs> so the world changed. Yes, we were no September longer. September 11, 2001. Yeah, we had lost our jobs, so funny thing changed. that. Um, we were working for a small a startup game company and it didn't succeed. And one of the reasons it didn't succeed is somebody decided to uh, take their major sponsor and uh, uh, knocked down their uh, headquarters in the World Trade Center. At least one of the reasons why it didn't succeed. Yeah, there's also, you know, incompetence of the game no, designers no, no, and so on. No, no, never mind. Never mind. We're part of the game designers, remember? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, at any rate, just after this happens, I got uh, in contact with a fan who said she wanted to co-write a book with me. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I wouldn't mind having a job of, of writing a book. But, I, and I have a thousand million ideas of what you could write, of what book you could write. Um, but the funny thing is, she didn't want to write just any book. She wanted to write a book based off a Quest for Glory series. And uh, I was intrigued, but, you know, it would be very hard to write it. I mean, the hint book kind of does that if you've ever read the... Uh, Quest for Glory hint book. It has the character who shall not be named as the main character. Oh, the uh, prima, yeah, the uh, prima uh, yeah. strategy guide strategy to uh, Quest guide. for Glory. And so, uh, uh, we can name him Devin Aidendale. Devin Aidendale was the character in and that that's book. That's where it came from. That and, name. Uh, and that name has uh, become a canon, and uh, our only problem with it is we're in a Germanic setting, and why the heck do we have a guy with an English-sounding name in a Germanic setting? But other than that, no problem right. at all with it. So, at any rate, that was the the premise she came to me and said she wanted to write it at least this was all done verbally we were email in that time of day and uh, so therefore we she had this great idea that instead of having just one hero that uh, uh, does everything it's not just one hero it's a family it's a uh, three boys and a girl that each represent one of the character classes and then we create the story that brings them all together and tells the story that is basically what the series was um, and so uh, we did we uh, how we went about this is first we had lots and lots of chats on uh, IRS that's or a, IRL a, a, a um, right. No, IRC. IRC. Yes. Chat. Yes. Okay. Thank IRC. you. Yeah. IRL wasn't right. <laughs> uh, at any rate. Uh, so yes, we wrote this a distance. She lived in L.A. I lived here in Oakhurst. Uh, uh, Corey was living down in L.A. for part of that, so we did get together at sometimes. Corey was working on the uh, uh, poker game at that time down in L.A., but uh, most of this was done. Uh, long distance chatting and how we did it was a lot of this was written by she <laughs> took a character and I took a character and we passed it back and forth. I was uh, the character of Falcon and I was the character of Wren and she was Hawk and she was also Owl and so that's how we wrote it. We basically role played through our way through the game and uh, when we came to the end we wrote it all up and we had a manuscript that was the size of the last Harry Potter. Or the size of Who You Wrote Redemption. Yeah, one of the two. It was a, it was a little bit too big for a, uh, a young adult novel. Yeah, and we wanted to do this just like Harry Potter, but we didn't want to start out with the last book of Harry Potter. We wanted to do this, you know, uh, start out easy and fun and then basically get more and more complex as the thing goes on. Um, you will have to be reading the chat things so that if there's oh, anything that needs to come out. Yeah, I know. You don't just sit passively here. Uh, um, should should uh, we read this little uh, blurb that uh, somebody wrote for the uh, agents? Um, well, you could if you wanted to. I probably could, barely. Let's uh, see, probably Weidenbaum. Okay, fine. Uh, so we did uh, change some names. There's no Spielberg in this. There's uh, Ziegborg, which means uh, Victory Town instead of uh, yeah, so we uh, Playtown. We changed, you know, we scraped off the serial numbers for Quest for Glory because we didn't Shh. want... 
No, it had nothing. It has nothing, it has to, do nothing to do with Quest for Glory. It's completely unrelated yes. to Quest for Glory. This is right. a completely original book. Yes, entirely. And so this is the book. It is not that violating is not... anyone's copyrights. Yes, it is completely different. And uh, this is the. We did that first version. So then once we did that first version, we had to break it up. And so therefore, we broke this book up, this first game up. And that was just the first game. Sure, that wasn't is. the whole series. It was to tell the first game. We had more words than a Harry Potter novel. So I think they had a 12-book series plan, yes. but uh, they only wrote one of them. So, um, well, we wrote one and a half. We wrote the entire game at first, oh, and then right. we broke it up. Broke it down. And uh, this is the only extant copy. This thing I have in my hand is the only copy we have. Yeah, we don't have it in of digital the, form. Of the, of the book. This is the book. Uh, this is uh, what... Michelle Baker, my co-writer, yeah, she's now a famous writer now, and a famous author. Michelle Baker was my co-writer, and she is the one who wrote this final version. And so we do not have this. So with no further ado, How to Be a Hero Part 1, by the book. And the summary is, Hawk is a 16-year-old boy with holes in his boots and a hand-me-down sword. He can barely draw without falling over. He lives with his brothers and younger sister in an isolated alpine village. Hawk soon realizes that they all have no future in the village, so he leaves to find a new life for himself and his family. And that's probably good enough. Much for me to keep yeah, up. that's probably good enough. Okay, and so now I will start the story of... Story time with Lori Cole. And this is... Uh, to be a hero. How to be a hero. Uh, book one by the book. And this is chapter one. Beyond the gate. Well, first we have a new pun, though. Oh, we have a good pun? Yeah, the new pun is from uh, Ace and Rex. Keep scrolling off. When will you publish it for your adoring public? It may not be Bronte, but I bet it's a breath That's of a fresh breath air. air. Okay, that is a good pun. Let us start it out. And the answer is no time soon, but you know, we might self-publish at some point. Right. We uh, can do a Kickstarter for it, Louie. Rumor had it. Or uh, Indiegogo. We could. Oh, but I can't read if you're talking. Okay. All right. Rumor had it the gypsies had been spotted in the nearby forest. If the rumors were true, Owl's death was going to be their fault. Hawk flung open the gate leading from the tiny village of Alpendor, his breath exploding in clouds of frost as he strode down the path. Oh, I didn't have any problem with that. As recently as last year, his anger might have been made childish tears start to his eyes but at 16 he knew how to compress his fury into a tight little ball and swallow it the bleating of alpendorf's sheep faded from his ears as he headed toward the snowy edge of the woods here the sheep never grazed for the forest was thick and full of wild and hungry creatures right now any place was preferable to alpendorf it was a lousy, cold, cloudy day, and his feet left deep impr imprints on the muddy path behind him. If not for the movement of the gypsies, which signaled the melting of the ice from Nordhoff Pass, no one at the village would have known that spring had arrived at the higher altitudes. No one would have known that it was time to drive the sheep to the spring pastures, time to force Hawk and his two brothers to give up their isolated life at the healer's cottage and come along. Falcon, Hawk's twin, was just the kind of sturdy, obedient dullard who would excel as a shepherd. But sickly 14-year-old Owl wouldn't last a week outdoors on these chill nights. If their guardian, Wil Wilhelmina, had still been alive, she would have insisted that Owl stay and continue his apprenticeship with her. He was far better suited to a healer's life than a shepherd's. But Auntie Willie was dead. And so were Hawk's hopes. He tried to stand up to the village elders that afternoon, but to no avail. The headman himself had ordered the three boys to start packing up their belongings, because in 11 days, the first quarter moon of the spring would give them enough light to move the sheep to the newly cleared Nordhoff Pass. Damn those gypsies. To make matters worse, Hawk's little sister, Wren, had been ordered to serve as a household assistant to the headsman's wife, who had only a son. No more climbing trees for Wren. No more practical jokes. They'd make a lady of her yet, they said. Hawk shuddered. 
The sound of belligerent voices drew him from his dark mood, and he hesitated. Veering off this path, he started toward the noise. If there was a fight going on, Hawk was in a perfect mood to pick a side and start swinging. Some ways off into the forest, Hawk saw Gunnar, the headsman's son. Gunnar was 17, tall and brick solid with the beginnings of a mustache. He was the only boy in the village who could beat Hawk single-handedly in a fist fight, and he had been proving this over and over for as long as Hawk could remember. Just seeing him made Hawk's stomach knot up, and the unpleasant feelings that doubled when he spotted Gunnar's three sidekicks. They'd all ganged up together to pummel someone Hawk could barely see, except for the occasional flash of unusually bright clothing through the moving mass of dull brown wool. A gypsy. Hawk stood back watching for a moment. He heard gypsies were good fighters as well as thieves and kidnappers, so maybe Gunnar could get his own face rearranged for once. There was always hope. As the open door boys shifted their positions, Hawk got an unexpected glimpse of the gypsy's face. He was small, dark, younger than Hawk had first thought, perhaps 11 or 12, Ren's age. The boy showed no fear, but his eyes were swelling shut and his mouth was a thin line of pain. Gunnar dragged the boy to his feet, but the boy fell down again immediately with a sharp cry. Without even realizing what he was doing, Hawk jogged up to the, jogged up to the group and shouted for Gunnar to stop. Gunnar looked over his immense shoulder, and his face broke out in a slow, unpleasant smile. Hey, Hawk, he sneered. I should have known you'd show up to defend your relative. Hawk's fist clenched. Being accused of gypsy blood on top of everything else was simply too much. It was ridiculous anyway, since he and his siblings were slender and fair. As foundlings, however, they could be almost anything, and Gunnar never missed an opportunity to remind him. I don't see why you insist on picking on someone half your size, said Hawk. Afraid of a fair match? What would be a fair match? countered Gunnar. A scrawny sheep herder, maybe? I'm not a sheep herder, growled Hawk. Sure you are, said Gunnar. You're lucky that I let you do that instead of sewing frocks like your sister. The image made a vain throb in Hawk's temple. You'd be a better... <laughs> You'd be, you'd make a better lady than me, he said through clenched you'd teeth, seeing as you always have an escort to protect you. Me, In response, Gunnar jerked his head towards his companion, signaling them to step away. Then he beckoned Hawk with a single curt gesture. Hawk rushed him eagerly, and the two grappled for a moment, straining for the advantage. Hawk became suddenly aware that he had grown quite a bit over the winter. He was now nearly eye level with Gunnar. No sooner had Hawk experienced a joyous rush of confidence than he felt Gunnar's boot slam him in the kneecap, sending him buckling forward. Hawk threw his weight against Gunnar, and they both tumbled to the ground. The two boys rolled this way and that on the muddy forest floor, punching and kicking and howling. Hawk felt a fist smash into his eye and a boot connect numbingly with his ankle. Ignoring the pain and the hot blood streaming down his cheek, Hawk kept struggling and punching. At last he felt the immense satisfaction of Gunnar's nose breaking against his fist. To Hawk's astonishment, Gunnar rolled onto his side, pressing both hands to his face, and began to bawl like a baby. Hawk rose pantingly to his feet and squared off against Gunnar's three companions. Two of them immediately lifted their hands in surrender, while the third scrambled to pull Gunnar up off the ground. Then, without another word, the four of them beat a hasty retreat to the village. Huck stood for a moment, delighted and dazed, then shook the mud out of his hair. That big ox would think twice before challenging him again. Huck heard a faint sound and turned. The gypsy child was still struggling to rise to his feet. A quick glance at the grotesquely twisted foot told Hawk that the boy's ankle was probably broken. Night was falling, the wind was rising, and now the boy was finally beginning to look frightened. 
Can you find your way home all right? Said Hawk reluctantly. Okay. Zetsch! Snarled the boy at him. Hawk had no idea what it meant, but he had a pretty good idea that it wasn't. I'm fine, thanks. Glancing out at the forest, Hawk repressed a shudder. Occasionally, in broad daylight, he had ventured into the edges of the forest to hunt small game, but now dusk was approaching rapidly. Larger, more dangerous creatures would be prowling about, not to mention the gypsies themselves. Hawk really ought to be getting back to the village. The boy was nothing but a thief and a tramp. He was obviously used to running around in the forest and could probably take care of himself. Hawk started to turn back along the mud path, and then he hesitated. Would the boy find his people before something else found him? Considering that the poor boy would probably have to crawl home, the odds were against him. Hawk shook his head as his own foolishness. The very idea of risking his life for a gypsy. The boy would probably repay him by stabbing him in the back. Nevertheless, Hawk slowly approached the boy the way one he would a wild animal, prepared to spring back at any moment. The young gypsy just crouched in the snow, watching him with wary, pale, yellow eyes. Wren had often te been teased about her gypsy eyes, but hers was a natural shade of amber, nothing like the creepy animal hue of the pair that were now fixed on Hawk's face. The fear that snaked through Hawk in response was nothing like he had felt at the sight of Gunnar. This was something more primal and harder to shake. Hawk hesitated, then he reached out to help the child to his feet. He tried to guide the boy's arm around his waist, but the boy let out another string of gypsy epithets and fought him, nearly falling over again. But at last, the boy seemed to understand his own predicament and relaxed, leaning on Hawk, Hawk with obvious reluctance. Together, they hobbled through the darkened forest. As they made their way deeper into the forest, the furtive sounds of nocturnal animals made the hairs rise on the back of Hawk's neck. The ground, turning rapidly from mud to slush as they walked, was noisy and thick beneath his feet. His eyes strained to pierce through the dusky gloom into the crowded of evergreens beyond. Twice he swore as he caught a shadow of something slipping through the trees, now on the right, now on the left. Was it the same creature circling them? or two predators stalking them from either side. Soon it would be too dark to tell. The boy at his side seemed undisturbed, but Hawk himself was not so confident. The slush turned to ice, then ice to snow. At last they came to a ring of six gaudily painted wagons arranged in a rough semicircle around a crackling bonfire. Beautiful, sleek gypsy horses wandered through the area untethered. Their bell their belled manes jingling as they snuffled through the snow for bits of winter grass. Before Hawk and the boy could enter the camp, they were intercepted by a group of five men and two large, bristling gray dogs. The dogs growled, and Hawk's own hairs stood on end in response. They were shaggy, feral-looking animals with long, pointed snouts and golden yellow eyes. Not dogs, Hawk realized. Wolves. The five men were broad and muscular, with dark curly hair and skin in various shades of bronze. Upon sighting the men, the boy let go of Hawk and tried to hobble forward. A man with a peppering of silver in his back, black hair took a step forward, his jaw set and his shoulders squared for a confrontation. All the other men watched him expectantly. Ignoring Hawk, the man said something to the boy in a guttural voice. The boy replied quietly with his head down. To Hawk's horror, the man abruptly slapped the boy to the ground. Before Hawk could respond, the leader picked the boy back up, held him at arm's length, and spoke to him again, laughing. The boy nodded sullenly, and then his face slowly broke out in a rueful smile. The leader handed the boy to the man beside him, who hoisted the boy effortlessly into his arms and carried him off. Then the leader turned to Hawk. The slight softness in his face disappeared immediately. He stepped towards Hawk, speaking again in his strange, growling language. His yellow eyes snapped with anger. Hawk started to back away, then realized he was surrounded. 
He could see that the leader knew his, well, his fear. With another growl, the leader gestured for his men to withdraw, opening the path for Hawk's retreat. Then the leader took a step closer to Hawk and glared at him with a clear challenge, pointing harshly toward the way out. Hawk couldn't understand the words, but the meaning was clear. Run away, little boy, if you're afraid. Beads of sweat formed on Hawk's forehead, but he stood his ground. The leader stepped closer and barked a command again, his eyes reflecting the fire eerily in the twilight. The gypsy drew his lips back in the snarl of hostility, revealing pointed canines like the wolves. Hawk stumbled a step backwards, then stopped himself. He had seen what a wolf pack did to the prey the moment it turned his, its back. He felt safer facing his foes. Hawk and the gypsy stared at each other down from within spitting distance. Luminous yellow eyes bore into Hawk's, but Hawk refused to give in to his fear. Suddenly, a hand lashed out from behind the gypsy, savagely boxing the man's ear. Hawk turned to stare in shock, and he saw a, a wizened old woman leaning on a crutch. He hadn't even noticed her approach. The man cringed, hanging his head, and the old woman let out a rapid fire string of babble so caustic that even Hawk winced. The five men, clearly chastened, swunk away, leaving Hawk and this old lady to stare at one another in the ruddy firelight. Her eyes, too, were moon yellow. She looked him over for a moment, and Hawk found himself holding his breath. Then, still silent, she turned her back on him and began to hobble away. Hawk ex exhaled slowly, thinking it safe to leave. Suddenly, the old woman wheeled around and hobbled back toward him. Before Hawk could decide how to react, she grabbed him by the neck of his shirt, pulling him toward her. He then, she de then led him towards the large wagon painted in vivid shades of lapis, emerald, and gold. The old gypsy woman climbed up into the back of the wagon and motioned for Hawk to enter. Afraid of having his ears boxed, he obeyed. Inside the dimly lit, lit space smelled pleasantly of lavender and pine. The walls were lined with what looked like open drawers. A hanging lantern cast swaying, tremulous shadows across the room, giving Hawk the uneasy feeling that the wagon had begun to move, carrying him far away. The gypsy sat down facing him and pulled out a small bench between them to use as a table. When Hawk sat down, she poured a drink from a green glass bottle into a wooden cup and swallowed it in one gulp. She poured again and handed the cup to Hawk, indicating that he should drink. He tried to imitate her actions and nearly sprayed her with the burning liquor that before he managed to choke it down. She snorted with obviously obvious annoyance, but she could he could swear that one corner of her mouth flickered with amusement. Perhaps it was the unsteady light. Putting the cup back on the shelf, the gypsy woman turned to stare at Hawk once for a moment. Without taking her eyes from his, she reached into one of the side drawers and pulled out three leather bags. Her movements were confident, almost hypnotic. She spilled the contents of the first bag on the left side of the bench they were using as a table. Leaning closer, Hawk saw a small pile of gold coins. Hawk had never seen so much money. Elbendorf was a barter-based community with very little need for coins. The gypsy emptied a second bag on the opposite of the bench. It held a small sheathed dagger with a handle of a carved bone in the shape of a wolf's head. The third bag, larger, she, she opened carefully and displayed its contents in the center of the bench. It held a plain wooden box with a latch. The gypsy waved her hand over the coins, the box, the dagger. Then she held her hand up, palm outward towards Hawk, and gave it a final flourish. Choose. Hawk's eyes immediately flickered to the gold on the left side of the bench. But what good would it do in Alpendorf? 
The dagger looked interesting, but he had his own blade waiting for him back at the healer's hut. A beautiful, shining, mysterious sword that he had owned for as long as he could remember. He had no need for a lesser weapon. Furthermore, the box intrigued Hawk. He reached for it to see what was on the inside, but the gypsy gave his hand a sharp smack and scowled, shaking her head. Then she repeated the previous gestures. The coins, the box, the daggers. Choose. After a moment's deliberation, Hawk pointed to the box. To his surprise, the old lady smiled. Carefully, she put the box into the bag and handed it back to him. After cleaning the other gifts and stowing them away, she shooed him out of the wagon. The men Hawk had seen before were hovering anxiously outside, watching as the old woman followed Hawk out. Hawk watched as the two gypsies' eyes met. The man asked a her a question, and she answered. They both laughed heartily. Then the man turned to Hawk, clapped him hard on the back, and motioned him out of the camp. Two of the younger men accompanied Hawk back to the village. They hung some distance behind him, talking and laughing, but Hawk had no idea what they were saying. Their hostility had seemed to have vanished, however, replaced by rollicking amusement. When they came in sight of the village gate, the two men nodded at Hawk. Hawk turned and watched as they faded back into the shadows. After a moment, he heard footsteps approaching him and turned to see the familiar silhouette of his twin. In the fading light, Hawk could just make out the tussled gold of his brother's hair, and he didn't have to see Falcon's face to know it was tight with worry. I'm fine, Hawk said in response to his twin's unasked question. I knew you'd be all right, said Falcon quietly. I'm sorry that the elders made you so angry. Hawk just gave a stiff shrug. He didn't want to think about the elders right now. I see you got into a fight, observed Falcon as they walked side by side back to the healer's hut. I broke Gunnar's nose. Falcon's mouth closed as though to express disapproval. But then he closed it again. Apparently, even the tender-hearted Falcon couldn't find it in himself to be upset at Gunnar's misfortune. I also went to the gypsy camp, Hawk added. At this, Falcon stopped in his tracks and turned toward fully to face him. Why? What happened to you? I'll tell you when we get home. The hut where Hawk lived was still referred to as the healer's even though there was no longer a healer in residence. It stood at the far end of the village, beside the area where the sheep were bedded in for the winter time. Tonight, the glassless window windows were shuttered against the chill winds, giving the outside a bleak and cheerless appearance. Snow clung to the thatch on the north side of the roof, above the door. As Hawk and Falcon approached, a smell of wood smoke and stewed cabbage welcomed him forward. The front door flew open before Hawk could touch it. Wren was there waiting, dancing from one foot to another. I thought you had run away forever, she said, looking almost disappointed. Stolen a gypsy horse and gone off to become a highwayman. Hawk ruffled her boyish cropped hair, which had recently been cut yet again as a solution to hopeless tangles. You won't believe what happened to me, Hawk said, gesturing for them all to join him at Wilhelmina's old work table. Owl, thoroughly absorbed in his history book, took a bit longer to join them. His deep blue-black eyes were distant, and his slightly too long hair was rumpled from where he'd been leaning against the wall. Hawk related the story of the boy and the gypsies, and found that his audience was instantly rapt, even Owl. None of them had ever met a gypsy in person before, although Wilhelmina had done some trading with them from time to time. As his story came to a close, Hawk brought out the gypsy's box and set it on the table. And this is what I chose, he said by way of conclusion. What's in it? said Wren, asked Wren, squirming in her chair. I don't know, said Hawk. That's what we're all about to find out. Wren rubbed her hands together with obvious glee. Even Falcon and Owl were leaning forward ever so slightly, their eyes fixed on the box. Slowly, 
And showing the suspense, Hawk opened the lid. Inside the box was a small battered book of cheaply bound paper. The title page read, How to Be a Hero. Hawk's heart sank instantly. He could have been rich. Even the knife would have been more useful than a stupid book. No wonder the gypsies had laughed. He must have made their night. Is that all? said Wren with obvious disappointment. Falcon looked sympathetically back at Hawk, as though reading his thoughts. Hawk tried not to scowl. Well done, said Owl finally. Hawk was used to his brother's sarcasm, but when Hawk looked up, he saw in instead a look of intense interest lighting his younger brother's peaked face. I don't suppose you'd have any use for a book, Owl went on, reaching for it. I most certainly do, said Hawk, laying his hand protectively over his dubious prize. I know how to read. You'd never know it, said Haw Owl. I earned this book, said Hawk stubbornly, and it's mine. I'm going to read it right now. In fact, I'm going to stay up until I've finished it. Have it your way, said Owl. His face and voice were expressionless, but Hawk knew he was annoyed. Excitement over for the night, the siblings dispersed to go about their business. Owl went back to his history. Wren began making an elaborate cat's cradle out of Auntie Willie's best yarn. And Falcon simply lay down on the straw in the corner, his blue eyes drowsy and thoughtful. Hawk, still at the table, reached into the box and drew out the little book. Bored already, he turned to the first page. Welcome, hero, it read. Hawk snorted. Boy, had this book found the wrong guy. Amused, he read on. You may believe that you are not a hero. You may believe that your life is so mean, so low, so helpless and full of drudgery that you can never rise above it. But I, the famous adventurer of Samaria, know differently. Hawk found himself straightening in his chair, leaning slightly forward in the dim light. This is a special book. It only finds its way into the hands of the few, the proud, the true heroes. No matter what your station, no matter how humble your life may be, now that you have found this book, you have only to follow the steps contained herein, and soon you will be showered with unimaginable riches and glory. A little shudder passed through Hawk. Could it be true? But first, you must pay the price to make this book your own. Glory cannot be borrowed, and heroism cannot be stolen. Once this book is truly yours, the world will soon follow, and you shall have whatever you secretly and passionately desire. When you are ready and have paid the price, you may turn the page. Hawk hesitated. He hadn't paid anything. But he supposed, in a sense, that he had paid the gypsies' price by saving their boy. They'd given him the book to him freely, so it was his, wasn't it? With trembling hands, slowly, Hawk turned the page, and thus his adventure began. And chapter one. As I said, one chapter. <coughs> These are long chapters. So that is the first chapter of this book, and it sets up who our protagonists will be. And uh, that's the beginning of the story.